Good morning, everyone. I'm Amber Milt, and welcome to this special edition of The Balancing Act. When it comes to raising awareness for rare disease treatments, rare disease patients, even finding a cure for these diseases, there's no limit to how far we'll go. Today, we're gonna visit with the young lady who inspired our Behind the Mystery series. Plus, we're gonna learn about two more rare diseases, and it all starts right now. It's often perceived as only a pediatric disease, but in reality, it can strike at any age. We're talking about XLH, that's X-linked hypophosphatemia, a rare bone disease that's often underdiagnosed. Today, we're gonna to meet a family that's battling the disease as we hear in their own words what it's like to live with XLH. Every single day waking up, you step out of bed, your ankles are killing you, your knees are killing you, you reach for a cup of coffee in the morning, your elbow's popping and it's hurting. Pretty much every single joint has pretty bad pain, especially in the morning. It's really frustrating watching yourself decline when you know that you could, if I didn't have this disease, that I could be on a much different physical level. Living with XLH is sort of a silent pain. Um, I often wake up in the morning, ready to start my day. I step out of bed and then sort of crumple over. I do my best to ignore it and try to be as active as I can. But every time I brush my teeth, I discover a new cavity. I have four molars missing right now. It's honestly hard to keep up with the amount of dental work I need. My name is James Cooney. I'm sort of a jack of all trades. I was diagnosed with XLH probably when I was about seven or eight years old. My name is Sean Cooney. I work in film and real estate and I was diagnosed with XLH or hypophosphatemia when I was about five years old after I had bowed legs and pigeon toed, and my brother also had a similar condition, so we decided to test for phosphorus levels, and we found out that I had very low phosphorus levels. X-linked hypophosphatemia, or XLH, is an inherited bone disorder, and it's a problem with the body retaining phosphorus. And this low phosphorus results in problems with bone growth and problems with bone health, that start in childhood and last throughout the lifespan. The root cause of XLH are mutations in the PEX gene. PEX is important because when it's lost, FGF23, which is a hormone, increases in the body. That increased FGF23 results in the kidney not holding on to phosphorus and vitamin D not being appropriately synthesized. So when the bone doesn't have the appropriate amount of phosphorus, it becomes soft, it bends, it breaks, and it hurts. I was in cast for about a year when I was four or five years old. And I remember walking around the house and them with crutches, uh, going outside. Time, a lot of kids would be learning how to really run and ride a bicycle. I was learning how to walk with crutches. I didn't really think of it at the time uh, as anything that was too abnormal because my brother also had it. Um, but then I realized it was when uh, in school, you know, I was one of the very few kids that were in a wheelchair or in crutches for most of elementary school. Luckily, around the time that we realized my little brother, Sean, also had these problems, um, that's when I think my mom got the hunch it was genetic. She realized maybe there's something bigger here and uh, took us in for uh, phosphate testing and we discovered that we have hypophosphatemic rickets um, and that it's X chromosome linked and that it's something that we carry, we will pass on to our kids and we inherited from our, uh, from our mother and from her parents and grandparents. 
So XLH is an inherited disorder. So it usually presents in childhood, and but its symptoms and its effects reach far into adulthood. So it has effects throughout the lifespan. It illustrates how sometimes you don't know you have an inherited disease in the family until several generations actually have symptoms. This is a genetic disease, and in fact, their mother was living with the disease for 30 years and didn't even know it. And then when they looked back in their family tree, they were then able to appreciate that their grandmother and great-grandmother were affected by this disease. So it was a big consideration for their family when it comes to family planning. For Sean in particular, when he and Susie found out that they were having a baby girl, we knew that that baby girl would have XLH. So they could establish care with a doctor that knew about XLH, and they could start to plan for the future for both themselves and for their baby girl. One of the major concerns of mine is my ability to interact with my kids. Uh, I have a daughter now, I plan on having a few more kids, uh, which I'm very, very excited about. Uh, but with my daughter, I have to be very careful that I don't drop her because it'll happen just in an instant. Your legs will give out and, um, and that could be very dangerous. Uh, and when I become older, uh, in a decade from now, maybe more, I do, I want to be able to throw a ball with my kids. And um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do that. You know, I might, I might be wheelchair bound again, and that's difficult. So if you suspect that you may have XLH or a family member may have XLH, you need to ask to be tested with a serum phosphorus. It's a simple blood test. Unless the doctor thinks about it and checks it off separately, it will not be tested in the chemistry panel. Since XLH is a rare disorder, it is very important to find a physician that can diagnose and manage XLH. These types of physicians include pediatric and adult endocrinologists, geneticists, and nephrologists. I think it's very important to find a doctor that knows what the condition is because they won't understand the whole body impact that it has. They might not get why certain things hurt or why you're experiencing the pains you are unless they really understand the condition. This is a chronic disease and it just progressively gets more and more challenging. And I think it's really important that people just do not ignore it. It's important to maybe connect with the network of people to understand the other things that people are experiencing because you might start to experience those as well. We may be bow-legged, pigeon-toed, knock-kneed, bad teeth, whatever. But in reality, those are symptoms of a chronic, lifelong genetic condition that you're gonna to have to manage for the rest of your life. There are several excellent resources available to patients with XLH. There's the XLH Network that can be found at xlhnetwork.org. In addition, for a number of rare disorders, there's globalgenes.org and ultrarareadvocacy.com. I think knowledge is power in this case, and really it's, it's not too hard to comprehend, but the implications are so drastic when you don't know what this condition is and you don't know how to treat it that it almost seems crazy to not at least check for it and for doctors to know what it is. That was such a heartwarming story and important information that anyone can use who's living with XLH. For more information on this rare disease, talk to a physician who knows XLH. Visit a patient advocacy group such as the XLH Network website, or you can visit ultrarareadvocacy.com to hear more from others with XLH. Of course, you can always go to our website, thebalancingact.com. Stay with us. Neuroendocrine tumors, known as NEDs, are often hard to diagnose as symptoms vary widely among patients, and many symptoms are often mistaken for other conditions, such as irritable bowel syndrome. Once they're finally discovered, the tumors have often already grown or spread. We'll take a closer look in this behind the mystery story. I was tired all the time, and I was a young mom, and so a lot of doctors just felt that that was normal. 
for you know having young children and all, but I knew there was something more. I really just did not feel well. And so I kept pursuing it and I went to different doctors and I was told a lot of different things, including that I was neurotic. And finally, um, I had an exploratory surgery and they found a tumor in my small intestine. My name is Judy Goltz. I am 57 years old and I was diagnosed with neuroendocrine cancer 15 years ago. Neuroendocrine tumors are unusual tumors that start in the endocrine cells of our bodies. We have endocrine cells scattered throughout almost every organ in our body, but the most common sites for neuroendocrine tumors to develop are the lungs, the intestine, or in the pancreas. I had a wonderful surgeon who really was diligent in searching. Um, nobody had mentioned cancer prior to me going in for surgery, and uh, they felt very much that they were gonna find something benign. Well, there's one common hormonal symptom uh, that's associated with neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, that's a syndrome called carcinoid syndrome, and one type of neuroendocrine tumor is called a carcinoid tumor. When I woke up in the hospital, I got the good news and the bad news, but the uh, good news is that um, they found it, and at that point, I was relieved because I knew that there would be care, you know, that I would be able to finally feel better. There are a variety of different ways to detect and diagnose it. Those ways include x-rays, CAT scans, procedures like a colonoscopy, blood tests, and even recently some newer sophisticated radiologic techniques that are specific to identifying neuroendocrine tumors. So being diagnosed with neuroendocrine cancer was a little bit of a shock for me because when I did learn about the disease and I educated myself on it, I realized I didn't have any of the typical symptoms. When patients are newly diagnosed, they can come to us through our website. There's a ton of information, everything from uh, the basics to videos they can watch to information about upcoming events where they can go to a conference and learn more. We have a slogan in the community, if you don't suspect it, you can't detect it, which means you have to be, as a physician, or even a patient who's being very proactive because they perhaps have a diagnosis for a disease which they're not getting better from. Uh, you have to be proactive, you have to consider carcinoid or another neuroendocrine tumor as a diagnosis when the symptoms may actually be symptoms that are of more common diseases, but those common diseases are not what the individuals have. So a patient with a lung neuroendocrine tumor might have symptoms of cough and wheezing, almost identical to the symptoms that someone with asthma might have. A patient who has a neuroendocrine tumor in the intestine might have intermittent, vague abdominal discomfort, identical to the symptoms that someone with irritable bowel syndrome might have. So these are some of the challenges that make the tumor so difficult to diagnose, especially at an early stage. So about nine years after I was diagnosed, I became more symptomatic, and I had another reoccurrence of a GI bleed. And I started to develop some abdominal pain. I would have intermittent di diarrhea. I would have something called, they called flushing. And flushing is when you uh, become very um, hot and red, but it's not like hot flashing. Hot flashing is when you're wet and you sweat, and hot and flushing is when you just become very hot and very red. And I was having those symptoms. And um, I started on medication. Some of those treatments are medications that have very few side effects, uh, which can help suppress the hormone secretion and make patients feel a lot better. Uh, there are additional medications that can help slow down the growth of the tumor. I think the most important message is to always listen to your body and to pursue any kind of investigation or medical care that you can to get the answers. If you're not comfortable with yourself and you really know that something is wrong, you're really feeling uncomfortable, you need to pursue it. With improved awareness, people will be able to identify the tumors earlier when they can be cured with surgery, or at least at a point when effective treatments can be started at an earlier time. You need to really, really listen to that inner voice, and I do believe that we all 
know when something is wrong. Sometimes we choose to ignore it, but I think that when you're uncomfortable enough, you need to pursue it. 20 years ago, uh, neuroendocrine tumors were in many ways a forgotten disease. There were very, very few effective treatments that have been identified for patients who have neuroendocrine tumors. We've seen a real shift just in the past five or 10 years. There's been a renewed interest in neuroendocrine tumors and renewed success in identifying successful treatments for these patients. I have good days and I have bad days, but uh, most of the time I feel pretty good. Uh, I think this is just something that you live with and you uh, listen to your body. And when I'm tired and I don't feel good, I take those days. And when I feel good, I try to make the most of life. I think the future is very bright for neuroendocrine tumors and for patients living with the disease and those to be diagnosed as well. We're seeing huge advances in treatment options and imaging, and I think there's a lot to be hopeful for. You know, you still get to live your life and you still get to enjoy lots of other things. And just to appreciate that this is just the piece of luggage that you were given to carry on your journey. But everybody gets luggage. Sometimes luggage is heavier, sometimes it's lighter, but it's just part of our journey. And for more information on diagnosing and treating neuroendocrine tumors, visit carcinoid.org or our website, thebalancingact.com. On this special edition of The Balancing Act, it's only fitting that we welcome back Ilana Jacqueline. Managing editor of The Rare Daily at Global Genes and author of the soon to be released book, Surviving and Thriving with Chronic Illness. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. Welcome back and congratulations on the book. I want to get to that. I'm very excited about it. But I, do, I also want to remind our viewers that the first time we met you, you, you really are the inspiration of our fabulous segment, Behind the Mystery. And, and what you've been through. Recap a little bit of your struggles. I have two diseases. One is called primary immune deficiency disease, um, and the other is called dysautonomia. And both of them really have a major effect on my day-to-day -day life. How so? Basically, they really affect my immune system, and then dysautonomia also affects uh, my autonomic nervous system, which mm -hmm. is all the things in your body that are supposed to be kind of on, on you know, automatic. Mm -hmm. uh, so things like your circulation, your heart, um, So your some things that maybe I take for granted Yes. Are you know, for me, eating a, a meal is something that I have to really think about, and um, I have a lot of different medications to regulate everything. But it hasn't stopped you. Nope. And you've brought so much awareness to the Balancing Act with the segment Behind the Mystery, and now with your book, which is called Surviving and Thriving with Chronic Illness. Tell me about that and how excited you must be. Yes, I'm very excited about the book. It's been a long time coming. Um, it actually started because I've been blogging on my blog, letsfeelbetter.com, for several years. And um, I talk about everything from my illness and, and how it affects my relationship, my work, my independence. Your daily life. My daily life. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so the book kind of goes into that a little bit more. It gives my personal advice, but it also takes advice from doctors and therapists and patient advocates, as well as takes the stories from other patients and kind of combines it all. And what would you like the reader to take away when they read your book? That they're not alone. That you know, these chronic, invisible, rare illnesses, that there are other people, there is a community of support out there. Um, if you go to a bookstore right now, there are not many books on chronic illness and how to manage that, um, or at least how to manage your life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like how to manage going to school or getting through work or dealing with the stigma of chronic illness. And having hope. And having hope. Thank you so much. The book is called Surviving and Thriving with Chronic Illness. I wish you so much luck with the book and come back and let us know how it's doing, okay? I will. Thank you so much. And if you'd like more information, again, you can go to her blog, which is letsfeelbetter.com. That's letsfeelbetter.com or just check out our website, balancingact.com. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. We'll continue to bring you more behind the mystery stories. Remember, you can head to our Facebook page and our website, and of course, follow us on Twitter because we've got lots more there. Thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll see you next time.